start computing. The outline of today's presentation is as following. Uh, we'll start off by defining what cloud computing actually is, how is it used today as a service, then we'll briefly touch the topic of five Vs of big data. We'll also discuss heterogeneity in the cloud, a little bit of how you would model your application in the cloud, semantics of an application, then James will talk about semantics for data modeling and service enrichment. Then we'll get into adding semantics to cloud applications. And then finally, James will talk about the Mobi Cloud application, which was developed here in Noesis. So to start off, I'm sure we all have used cloud computing in one sense or the other. I'm sure we, have, we use uh, Google Docs. So Google Docs is nothing but an example of cloud computing. So we all are familiar with the fact that we use software on the cloud. And software is, in this case, nothing but a text editor, which is Google Doc. So now thinking about what cloud computing actually is. Is it grid computing? And what I mean by grid computing is that can you parallel process any application? Like, can you use multiple power of various computers at a given time? So is it that? Or is it utility computing, where you pay as you use, uh, much like electricity. So you can turn on all the lights, and you'll get some power from it, and you can pay as you use. And when you're not using it, you don't pay for it, right? So is it that? Well, we all know it's a mixture of that. You have this feeling of unlimited resources, but also you have to pay for it, not in the case of Google Docs, for sure, but if you're using Amazon Web Services or Amazon Cloud Services, then you do have to pay for the amount that you use. So with that said, we can also say that it is a service because you pay for it. And to e exemplify this thing, uh, cloud computing, you can think of it as Amazon Web Services where you can rent out hardware. Basically, it's a virtual machine. You can rent out some virtual servers and you can use them to actually perform any calculation or you can launch your application on the cloud itself. So you can do various things. So you can use the services that are provided by not you, but certain companies to actually use uh, that, their power. So all you're doing is writing your own piece of code, but it's being uh, run from their server. So everything is done there. All you have to do is pay for whatever you are using or whatever amount of services that you're using from that company. So with that being said, we can divide cloud computing as a service into three halves, or three parts. First, you have SAS, which is software as a service, PAS, which is platform as a service, IAS, which is infrastructure as a service. Now, I already discussed a lot about SAS, so we all are end customers here. We all can actually go log into Google Docs write whatever we want to. So we are users in this case. Now PAS, I'm sure a lot of you here are actually PAS. That is, you have this Google App Engine, for example. You go on there, you have this feeling, well, not feeling, think of it as an Eclipse ID. You go on there, you have the ability to write your application, and then you can run it, you can test it. And then you have your end users again, which would be all of us or any other user who can use it. So platform as a service is different from SAS because you can actually write your own application, you can deploy it. So that is the difference between PAS and SAS. Now coming back to IAS, infrastructure as a service. What PAS doesn't allow us to do is balance load, memory management, that kind of thing which a regular system administrator would do. For that access, we need to be able to uh, subscribe to the service of IAS. <coughs> so AWS, Amazon Web Services, it lets you do that. Uh, I think one of the examples would be you can actually uh, log in there, you can ask Amazon Web Services to provide you 10 nodes, 100 nodes, and you can access all those nodes and distribute your work between them. You cannot do it if you are writing, uh, if you are only accessing or subscribe to PAS. Any questions? So now getting into a little more detail about infrastructure as a service. As I mentioned, it's, it's more like sysadmin kind of place. So you have your operating system, 
you can uh, create your instances. And uh, with respect to end users, you do not have anything to see what IAS personnel is doing. So you don't know how many nodes are running, you don't know how much memory they have available. All you as an end user see is just there's an application. So you can think of a, an example would be uh, Netflix. So you have Netflix, which is actually hosted on Amazon Web Services. They use Amazon Web Services. And in that case, they have to be, uh, they have to subscribe to IAS. Although their application might be PAS, but they have to subscribe to IAS. The reason for them to do or subscribe to IAS would be as simple as load balancing. It's, it's kind of like a business model, if you think of it that way. It's possible that at nighttime, people might be viewing TV shows and movies, so there is high traffic. So they need to instantiate more computers. But let's just say in the morning between 10 a.m. to 1 p.m., there's not a lot of load, and there's not a lot of traffic. So as an IAS subscriber, they have the ability to reduce their load so they can save some money. And that would be probably a benefit of being IAS user. So again, I think IAS lets you develop applications, provide stability to your application if you're uh, using it as PAS. Again, platform as a service. Uh, I don't know if you guys have ever used Google App Engine. So again, you have this feeling where you can uh, write your own application. It gives you the complete environment. You can write the application, but you cannot actually modify anything at the OS level. You do not have the option to do that. So again, you can change some system configuration, but you, you have permission issues in this case. Software as a service, uh, I went through that. Again, you have access to various software suites. Uh, in the book, uh, it was pretty simple, but there is a negative thing to it, and I would like to mention it. If you have ever noticed, the version would be always controlled. It is possible that you are using Microsoft version 2010, but it is possible that the cloud provider is still on 2007. So you would have to stick to 2007, although you can use a uh, compatibility package in order to transform the document. But again, it would depend on cloud provider when they want to update. So you are kind of in this version struggle between the cloud and your side. So with that being said, I will talk about five V's of big data. I think Dr. Chef already talked about it, but let's just recap. So when we talk about five V's of big data, we have volume, variety, velocity, veracity, and value. Volume is nothing but, we all know big data, huge amount of data. Variety, different kinds of data. Velocity, frequency at which the data is being captured, generated, or shared. Then you have veracity, where you kind of want to know how truthful or how, uh, what is the quality of the data. And then value. What is the benefit of actually solving a problem with big data to a given organization or even to an individual? But in this chapter, we are focusing more on variety and a little bit of answering the volume part of it. So variety, we are all very familiar with the term heterogeneity. That would be variety. So let me define it as is. Uh, it, it is from the book. So vertical heterogeneity is defined as, it is something that is found within the same type of clouds. It is caused by the interface and procedural heterogeneity across similar clouds. For example, IAS providers. I'm not satisfied, right? So what it actually means, I, I asked Ajit, who is uh, one of the authors, I asked him what it actually means, and he told me that, think of it this way, you have AWS, you have Rackspace, they're both IAS providers. So you have Rackspace.com, you have AWS. They're both infrastructure as a service providers. 
but it doesn't mean that all the infrastructure level things would be the same. So it can be different. How are you going to transform your application to work on AWS and also to Rackspace? That can be costly, right? So that would be your vertical heterogeneity. And then you have horizontal heterogeneity, which is defined as something that is found within different types of cloud. It is caused by the heterogeneity in the paradigm of each cloud type. What I found out was that, consider Amazon Web Services. You have a layer PAS, you have a layer IAS, and now as an application writer, you need to access some more resources from the operating system but you cannot do that because of the philosophy that divides the two, which is IAS would be great for system administrators, but PS would be great for <coughs> your programmers. But again, programmers need some sort of access to the infrastructure. If they cannot get that, then it causes issues. So with that being said, both these problems actually force users to stick with a particular vendor or a cloud provider. But there are solutions to that. Thank you. you have vertical heterogeneity, which again is between two similar cloud providers, IAS providers. So you can address those by uh, using middleware, which is a common concept in mobile computing. So in order to communicate with the hardware, you can write your own middleware. So you can use something like middleware to actually make sure that it can communicate with both AWS and Rackspace.com in this example. But again, we are trying to standardize these things. So for us programmers, we don't have to work hard to actually write an application for AWS and Rackspace. The other thing would be uh, horizontal heterogeneity. You cannot really overcome that. It is, it is very difficult to work on it because of the ideology that lies with the cloud providers that, well, we have to separate PAS from IAS. So now, it is part of the solution is uh, that we can do high-level modeling. And in terms of high-level modeling, what you can do is you can divide your data into three parts, or you can slice your data into three parts using types of semantics, level of abstraction, and software life cycle. So you can use these three techniques, I would say. So what types of semantics does is it provides portable and interoperability, portability and interoperability in cloud. It provides means of interacting with the cloud environment using web services. Then you have abstraction where you can actually uh, ontologically model some things at higher level. Not at the data level, but higher level. And then you have software life cycle, which I thought was pretty important because it is not a practical foundation. It is more like theoretical point of view. So you, when you are developing an application, it is, it is important that you are not at conflict with your team members or someone who you're working with or who are working on the same kind of application but maybe different features, that kind of thing. So it is important that there's team spirit and you are communicating well within the team. So now language abstractions. Uh, this is a figure from the book and also from one of the papers by Ajit. Here you can clearly see that you have logic and process, which can be uh, defined using UML in terms of development, deployment, and management. So UML is nothing but OOPs. So if you, if you know Java language, then you can actually develop it, you can deploy it, you can manage it. And then you have some system level configurations which you can use, which is ECML, EDML, EMML. ECML is, uh, is used to describe uh, development phase, EDML for deployment phase, and EMML for management phase. And then you have domain specific language up there. But notice the blank area. So there's nothing there. And I think James will probably cover part of it. So semantics of an application. It can be divided into four parts. I think Mary and Michael 
talked about it, but the names have changed here. So you have data semantics, you have system semantics, you have non-functional semantics, you have logic and process semantics. So data semantics pertains to data. So data availability, access to data. So everything that is related to a data would qualify under data semantics. So you need to know what you're doing. System semantics, this would be your, uh, you can think of it as make file or end build script in a way, if you're, if you're imagining. So here you would have all the things that would relate to deployment, load balancing. Again, we are talking about cloud, we need to maintain load. So in system semantics, you would have that. And non-functional semantics would be giving access to people, logging information, who is logging in, security credentials, that kind of information would fall under non-functional semantics. And then logic and process semantics, which would basically be the business logic. So whatever your program logic is, that would qualify as logic and process semantics. At this point, I would ask if there are any questions. Garish has kind of given an introduction uh, to the different types of semantics and the problems that exist in the cloud dealing with uh, the heterogeneity. So how do we actually apply uh, semantics to overcome the heterogeneity? Then uh, that's what I'm going to discuss here. Uh, starting with the data. So the data, every provider has some way that they like to store, uh, store their data on these cloud platforms. Uh, such as Amazon would prefer you use S3, uh, or Google has big, like something like their big table. But transferring that data, if you uh, off of those services, may be costly. Uh, just trying to you know go from some schema like as described there, some schema less distributed data store to some relational, to a traditional relational data store. Uh, it could be like a expensive one-time uh, cost that may not be worth it depending on how much data you're actually moving. But if you in, uh, instead do some high level modeling with RDF, for instance, uh, you can use the lifting lowering mechanism, which I believe Dr. Sheff mentioned pre uh, in a previous class, uh, to link your uh, the, whatever representation you may have on one system, and then using that model, uh, you can lift it up to that higher level and then bring it back down, lowering, to this new representation. So uh, so that helps you overcome this lock-in due to you know, your, users, your user's data. You want to be able to move that wherever so the user doesn't really see any difference. Another aspect is involving services. This is uh, you know, similar to web services in that uh, you know, the, you, uh, you access most of these platforms through some sort of web interface. And you want to be able to move between them. And as Harish mentioned, different providers, even with the same type of cloud, have a different, may have a different API. But in practice, they actually perform most of the same tasks. So you could, in theory, annotate uh, their service descriptions uh, to help you give to help you match up these different uh, providers and their APIs, which in theory could lead, uh, lead to facet search uh, to help identify some reusable services uh, and semi-automated service composition, saying that I want to build this application and I know I need services services of type X Y Z, and it can, you know the system can help figure out which services uh, are possible candidates, and then you can. Filter it further to finish out your application. Uh, and beyond just doing service, beyond just the service descriptions, you can also apply it to the service level agreements, uh, such as this example that was taken from the book, where the uh, you, through the use of SA REST annotations, you can 
take Amazon's uh, SLA and see that they have an uptime guarantee of 99.95%, and then you can use these annotations to extract it to uh, this web service uh, level agreement formalization. Now we talk about uh, like accessing different services, the agreements and licenses, uh, and the data. Now, how do you actually apply it to the the logic? And uh, as was somewhat mentioned in uh, one of the diagram with the uh, three dimensional slicing, there's domain specific languages, which is the solution presented in the book. And these domain specific languages uh, are basically executable, lightweight models, or they can also be described as lower grade semantic models. Uh, and because of that, they don't have, as, they have limited reasoning capabilities, but you can also link them to the higher level models to help get a more, uh, much richer description. And because they're executable, uh, they're meant to be executable, they can help fully describe your actual logic and then you're able to take these DSLs and actually feed them to a generator for particular platforms and have it spit out a functionally equivalent code across the different platforms. Uh, and the example that uh, I'm going to start covering in the next slide is using the Mobi, using MobiFlow, uh, which was developed here at Noasis and is meant for mobile hybrid uh, application or mobile cloud hybrid applications. And it's able to support through this, through just writing one DSL script, it's able to support Amazon EC2 uh, and Google App Engine on the cloud side, along with Android and BlackBerry on the mobile side. And all the code will be functionally equivalent, uh, if a little bit. Uh, so this is the uh, an example of the Mobi Cloud DSL, if, uh, which was presented in NG's paper. Uh, linked, uh, Side down at the bottom. And it's basically a simple to do application. And uh, as you can see, it points out that MobiCloud uses the model view controller uh, pattern. And there's a couple lines missing here, but uh, you can really take this, plug it into MobiCloud, uh, and get some actual functional code, which you know, would actually end up being like maybe 100 or 200 lines of, say, Java code for Android. And this will be the basis uh, for these examples. And as I you know, walk through those four types of semantics that Garish mentioned earlier, starting with data semantics again. Uh, and you can see that we had a uh, basically a standalone definition of a user. And so that was a that's a one-off, one-time deal, which isn't really a reusable uh, way to create this or to create more interop uh, more interoperability with other applications. But instead, you could reference uh, some ontology, such as in this case, a friend of a friend ontology, the friend of a friend ontology, uh, specifically the person entity, which makes your code potentially more reusable by having using the standard uh, and more interoperable for those who also use the same form of a user. Uh, now for logic and process semantics, uh, those are generally less re, uh, less reusable uh, just because you write it once and then you generally won't go back and rewrite it somewhere else and rewrite it somewhere else again. But you can still uh, use some use something like design patterns and specify those in your DSL uh, to help give a consistent form to it. So you know, in this case, it says that it uses the shared multi-ten pattern, which means that uh, they all the data shares a schema, but it's all stored separately. Uh, next, uh, next, next aspect is non-functional semantics, which uh, we can apply using annotations, as in the last couple examples, or we can link to a separate script, uh, some sort of separate configuration script. Uh, in this case, it's simply saying, for this controller of our to-do application, make sure that it's 
secure. And that's completely specified just by saying, you know, security pro profile, use SSL, rather than having to implement it or properly call it. The generator can take that and just uh, know to generate the code for it in that fashion. Uh, and finally, there's system semantics, which uh, aren't as tightly coupled to the actual application, so they may not seem immediately important as you're writing the script, but they become much more important when you actually deploy it because they describe stuff like load balancing, which on a cloud application is very important. Uh, you can just refer to a script or you can use annotations, uh, just like non-functional semantics. Uh, in this case, it's just telling you, uh, use this particular stack when we actually deploy it uh, onto the system. And then, let me zoom in. So this is that same app, but now it has some annotations to it to help you know, enrich uh, the actual description of your program and you know, increase some of its functionality. And this is all, you know, this is like 14 lines or so to describe you know, an entire application. You can deploy across multiple platforms of multiple different cloud types. So the, and although, if you notice, they're called domain-specific languages, which may seem limiting by their name, but because you can apply the semantics uh, more directly compared to a traditional language, it actually can be a bit richer. And, and can you categorize that as non-functional, mm -hmm. Which one? This annotation. Uh, the top one? Oh, this example. Uh, it's not functional. Oh, the top, the top part, the point profile. Just well, this example, you add the metadata like your friends and also. Uh, well, it, it's it's a mix of it's a mix of all the different ones. Like the top part is de describing a system, mm -hmm. uh, well, part thing. Uh, the models are describing data, and your controllers and views are helping to describe your actual. Uh, well, the controllers describe the logic and processing. So it kind of. Uh, it helps to encapsulate uh, most of those pieces, if not all. Or you could link to an external piece, uh, which can help better describe the particular aspect. So this is a full application. It's not just one uh, piece of application. OK, and that uh, ends our presentation. So, <laughs> uh, so I'll ask if there are any questions or comments. semantics and they're very similar to web uh, to the for for web services Pull that back up. and so it's very similar plus uh, in particular like something like the non-functional semantics a lot of uh, quality of that encapsulates quality of service and a lot of quality of service stuff has been discussed within uh, web services so it's really so something like DSL helps apply it here, but the semantics themselves uh, can be similar to the other items that we discussed. Well, maybe we can discuss how, uh, what's the challenge here compared with other kinds of semantics? Can I think the, the problem is how will you make your application as well as data and interoperable. Yeah, so it's yeah that's, that's, that's why we would apply semantics for those particular challenges. So it's not basically applying it to crunching some data, it's basically how will you make your application, how will, or rather how would you annotate your application so that um, you can write some 
abstraction layer over it to deploy it over multiple platforms. So that that yeah, will yeah, be like a totally different annotation process. It will be a, the modeling will be different. Uh, it depends. I mean, same means the. Uh, here we are using different models. We need to create the model for different clouds to match the requirement of that cloud, and accordingly we need to annotate our application. So, but if you are writing your So that whatever I said is goes in the middle middle. So middleware is basically a kind of abstraction layer what we are providing. So but you basically annotate uh, your data on the program, right? The domain the program written in domain specific language. Mm -hmm. right? mm -hmm. So and then you write to your middleware to interpret that and you you generate the ultimate code for each platform, yes, right? Yes. So if you are writing your middleware, mm -hmm. what is the exact use of uh, having uh, agreement on the, the So, So it's kind of when you are writing your middleware, at that time you need to know what kind of transformation you will provide from the application you will get or the data you will get to the different clouds. This middleware will be shared among different types of rules. Yeah. So you need some kind of agreement so that when you are writing that middleware code, you you get to know how to how exactly process it. So it's like everybody is following the same standard and middleware. Um, this oh, is kind of problem. No, I see. It's, I see a, a reason. Like let's say multiple people writing middleware to. Uh, Interpret the interpret your, language, your program, right? It means mm -hmm. specific language. In that case, there is a possibility of misinterpreting your data. Yeah. Right. So if you annotate that against a standard vocabulary, then you have then uh, everybody in the rule the middleware has to agree on that thing, right? Yeah, but, but still, if you are writing the middleware, yes, and you can read that thing. Mm -hmm. What is the use of the annotation? Still, you need some kind of annotation. So you need some kind of way to have that information about your data. Now, you can either provide it using annotation or you can come up with a different approach, but by some way means you have to do it. So it's always better to do it in a kind of standard way so that you can always going to enhance that middleware or something so like that. So like the readability of Yes, yes, yes. It's so I know like a year or so ago, Red Hat had OpenStack and some different things they were doing to sort of help ease the transition. Is, did any of that become like standard? Are there any standards around this for how to mark your services up so you can move them between different clouds? Or is it still just sort of wild west and right around the way? Actually, even if they might have provided, it might be between different IAS clouds. But if you consider the clouds like Google App Engine, and say if you want to move to Microsoft Azure, so App Engine would expect, accept your code in Java or Python, whereas yeah. that would accept in a yeah, completely so like that kind of interoperability can be solved by this application for Okay, so uh, just to get down to uh, the basics, so you have said that uh, we can distinguish between two types of objects, passive objects. We can distinguish between two types of objects, passive objects and active objects. So the passive objects are data items, you know, a file, a document. Right? Basically, you make a call and you get the whole data. There's nothing more to it. The call is extremely simple. There's nothing much about modeling about the failure of a call and um, the time it might take to get you and all that. You're only interested in the data, that's one aspect. Uh, there is an active object uh, of sorts or a resource where essentially it is uh, either a web service or an invocation of um, something like cloud 
uh, an application that has been wrapped up in whatever way you want. Uh, so in that case, that's an FT object where not only you're going to get you know uh, some output, but typically you have to give some input itself, like format you know data objects as an input. So that's why you have uh, you know data semantics for the input as well as output data elements. So if I have web service, I may make an invocation. Essentially, it's like calling a making a call. There will be some input in some cases. As other cases will be null. Um, if there is an input, you want to describe what format of input it can accept. And you want to describe that. And you want to describe in a semantic way by annotating it so that uh, uh, it would be easier for somebody to uh, uh, you know, create that, that kind of input objects um, or make a transformation from whatever way data you have into another form. Let's say that a web service takes a, an address as an input. Well, address has many different formats, right? So. If you have described the address semantically and saying that there are these things and the number of the street has, has to be this way and uh, you know zip code has been this format but in some places it may be pin code, not zip code, many of those things that you may describe. Uh, then uh, suppose your data for address was in an address book which had CS, you know, uh, which, had, which, which, had, uh, which had ICAL format or so some, sorry, format for some, um, uh, uh, just have limited format, let's say. Then you would know how to transform that into this form, right? So the semantics of the input has to be captured. The service will give you output. The semantics of that has to be captured. That all comes into that. Now the similar things would be also true whenever you you know any program, whenever you make any call. So in the case of invocation of cloud, um, uh, now you're talking about SaaS. Then you are invoking this full service, right? Salesforce kind of service, right? In that case, you'll be describing uh, things something very similar to uh, web service typically, right? Um, uh, of course, the call is different, the syntax is different, the behavior is to some extent different, but it would have some input to be given, you invoke it. Because it's an empty object, it can fail. Oh, first, of, first of all, because it, it has a functional description, so um, uh, you may want to say, oh, it gives you a quote. But um, because, because you will distinguish between the quote of the day and quote for a stock, right? That you can do so by symmetric annotation, and thereby you need to be able to kind of like you have a call, let's say a procedure call or a web service, uh, you know, uh, uh, invocation. Then you want to say, ah, it, 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 its function is this, and this is how it is described with respect to an ontology or domain model. Then obviously, uh, then because it is again an empty object, um, it will have, you know, quality of uh, service saying uh, the normal time it will take you to get answer is five seconds, right? Uh, or that uh, uh, you will have to give this credential to to get that to invoke that service. This is not what it does, but kind of how you're going to invoke that. So you have to model that too, right? And that. Um, uh, uh, you know, it will or, or, or you'll have to pass an account and it will charge you X money and there will be things along that line. So that is what you have to capture in non-function semantics. It's not about what it does, but to get it to do something, you'll have to model that semantics. And then this semantics is about things that may go wrong. Um, uh, so uh, in, in 1990s, early 1990s, um, uh, I started work on workflow value system. And um, so in the, in the case of workflow, uh, workflow is a series of tasks or actions or steps. Okay. So you do this, you take a paper, you give it to this guy, he signs it, give it a paper, he fills out the form, you give it to this person, he signs it, take it to give this bureaucrat, he enters something in a, in a web page. So that's kind of workflow, right? You three, in this case, there are three steps of the workflow. So we would describe that. But in that process, there will be a lot of exceptions to talk about. Oh, if that person is out of town, maybe you can get it signed by somebody else. If he's out of town for more than a week, then you can sign by other things. If the value of the purchase order is more than $1,000, then it's not this guy, but you have to go up one level higher. There are all these different things that, have, uh, uh, that you have to say, which may be part of functional description, but things go wrong, and you don't capture all the exceptions. How do you handle that? So all the runtime exceptions, typically, uh, uh, you invoke a service, it doesn't respond. Right? What do you do? What, what does an error code mean? 
all those things you would get into the um, you know execution semantics is what I had called. Now this is a uh, kind of a retake of what I described as data, functional, non-functional, and execution semantics. Okay, but in general principle still applies in the same kind of stuff there are. Uh, shares made an interesting point though that um, at least in the case of uh, clouds, uh, there's this traditional three types of you know the distinction of three types of clouds. So um, the kind of things that you will typically model will be different. Now there was a question and that Michael brought up as to um, you know isn't there any work on um, uh, some uh, standard and or convention uh, with regards to dealing with different clouds? So well there was an effort. There is a company that came up with a, a whole bunch of um, uh, ontological specification for modeling cloud services. Right? And so they are out there. Uh, to my knowledge, they have not gone through an industry ratification process or some standardization process. But this, that's a pretty good bit of work that is out there. Sometimes people do technical work and there is a you know big step from tech, doing the technical work to getting adopted by the users and industry people and so on and so forth. So the business reasons and uh, political reasons and so on and so forth. So uh, yes, there is a work in terms of being able to describe all kinds of stuff you need to describe with regards to the cloud services at different levels. Um, I, I forget, uh, but if you Google for you know cloud or related ontologies, you'll find that there are I think three or four uh, particular specifications uh, ontologies rather for different aspects of the things, and it costs similar at certain level to our classification of different types of semantics we have to capture. So they have correspondingly uh, similar uh, uh, proposals for uh, cloud uh, related mod uh, cloud uh, modeling ontologies. Did I capture most of the comments or questions? All right, so now, now uh, let's go to uh, the interesting uh, thing that uh, uh, um, you know followed uh, the last set of conversations. So I was talking something about parsing and something about um, you know, and then the shares uh, put up um, uh, fairly good, uh, you know, saying, oh, there is this entity NLP uh, thing, Sanford NLP thing, and then I had, uh, uh, I guess, <laughs> I was able to give uh, a, 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 a detailed uh, um, answer, so uh, or at least a let's say story and, and kind of explanation of what all the things are. So, did you guys read it? Who wants to summarize it? Who did not read it? No. Oh. How come? Look, I, I'll, my answer would be like, you can't say that, hey, uh, uh, I'm eating so I can't breathe. <laughs> <laughs> that is the life. You sign up to do course. You know, you know that you have research and you have work and all that. That's, that's, that's important. So um, the, the point is that if you're not ready, that means it's hard to do conversation, right? And have then participation. Anyway, so those who are ready. By the way, you have a good show. Yeah. You seem to be very at ease. So what, what did you think about the conversation there? I thought it clarified it. It did clarify some stuff. Hmm. But I'm, I don't know what it's going on. I'm sure what we're calling it. Uh, we're okay. details. Uh, we can bring it up, right? Uh, yeah. Right here, right? Alright, we need to get out of the search. We need to help us. Okay. Back to our post. Alright, so this was the conversation we were talking about. Take away, and I think there's a lot more, right? So, and there are several 
the reference is also there, right? Okay. Ramu, what did you get? I, I just found it once, but what I think is that we can get some information like whether this, like, this, this is a person, this is a person, being a person or organization or some entity with the help of NLP based techniques. Like let, let's say machine learning techniques and other NLP techniques. But the only thing is that it will be very costly thing to do those kind of things. That's not, I think, so the most important thing here they're using the they use the training set hmm. for if for identifying the different person and hmm. those things. So they are creating uh, after parsing they are creating a tree and based on that and the training set they are identifying okay what could be among the entities identified, what could be the person, what could be the organization. So it might not capture the the recent entities, also if it's based on the recent organization person, and those things, also it's based on NLP, so it might not be able to work accurately on the social data or the data which has noise. And other thing what I found with this is the processing time is also a kind of bottleneck because it takes around four to five seconds to parse the sentence and identify the things if we are using it on a normal machine, not on a big cluster machine. Um, one question. Do, do, you, do you use any knowledge-based language? No. Oh, we are talking okay, about so first. Uh, uh, the uh, kind of approach that Stanford NLP, uh, uh, the entity extractor does, right? the NER tool right, does, and there are others that I also pointed out here. What kind of NER exists? What type of machine learning algorithms are used? Besides Stanford NLP, what, you know, what is another major open source tool for processing system? And um, now, there is a uh, you know uh, a link here that tells you that these typically are trained. Let's see. Look at this number three here, right? So, for example, uh, uh, Stanford NLP, uh, sorry, name entity recognizing tool, as well as several others, use. This one, and there's I think some further advancement beyond that, but there is this CO NLL 2002 and 2003 task data sets. Right. So that is what is used to do training. Right? What does it mean? Suppose now, as Shreyan said, and as you, I hope you have gone through the example, the link he has sent, and typed in the sentence he gave you, and you looked at uh, uh, the entity uh, for organization, right? Now, um, a very interesting question that one needs to understand here. So if you go here and, you know, it understood that Federal Reserve Bank of New York, it, it identified that as an organization, right? <clears throat> now let us think about it a little bit. What does it mean? How did it recognize, uh, recognize uh, uh, as, a, uh, as, as an entity of the type organization? How? No, dear. I mean, we only talk. We only talk about training. It's not about this. Using ontology, what are the domain? No, dear. We are talking about NLP. That this is NLP right now. We are not even got. You know, Stanford NLP. You know, is is machine learning. That, that NER is based on machine learning, right? What What does it mean? Based on the phrases around. No, so so uh, what I would suggest here is that so just so that you get a better picture, please 
spend some time and go and look at what it is trained on, right? We know that it is trained on this, right? So what does it look like, that data set that looks like? What does it look like? Fundamentally, what it looks like is, it has that this example, Federal Reserve Bank of New York, is an example of organization. Somebody has manually said so. Somebody has manually created the data set of thousands of organizations. Right? So what happens here is, it's like a, you to a child you say, this is a book. This is your nose. Right? We, we tell the child that, right? Analogy. This is the nose. You also that is a nose, that is a nose, that is nose. And you know, oh okay, that's a nose. And then, and then maybe you can say that is a nose too. Right? That is learning process. Now what 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 fundamentally though has, has happened? But but it's a program after all. Does the program have any intimate understanding of what federal means in that? Does the program have intimate understanding that the New York part of Federal Reserve Bank of New York is actually um, uh, a, 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 you know, uh, that there are five or seven or whatever Federal Reserve Banks in the United States? And this, this is a New York branch of that, or New York, uh, you know, uh, uh, part of this multi-institutional uh, uh, framework. There are several federal, uh, you know, reserve banks in U.S. and this is the New York one. Does it understand that? It does not. So I have a question. So if you put in a, a company you never heard of in place of Lehman Brothers, yeah, will it pick it up? It might. Yes. Yeah. So how is it not using grammar text rules to approach that? That's the difference between the uh, you know the you you could write grammar. Rules also, you can write a natural uh, language, you know, you can do natural language processing based on rules also, a rule based technique. That can also, th that, that can be done, but that is not being done here. That will take thousands, uh, hundreds of people going over that particular area and give a lot of syntactic rules. Saying, if you look at a sentence uh, in this place and uh, this thing, if you come across something like this with this syntax, it is probably a, a, an organization. A human would give a whole lot of examples to, and this, those exam, those rules will be executed actually on the text to identify that. So that is a rule-based process, mm -hmm. and that is one technique for NLP. Here it is learning technique, machine learning technique, which does not learn the rules, it comes out in the black box. It, it comes, you know, so, um, the interesting thing to notice here is that there are a lot of things we can discuss here. So, one thing will be, look, look I mean, I don't think we can do an NLP class here. Um, uh, that will take up, uh, first of all, not, neither am I an expert, nor it will take a lot of time. But, what is important to understand is that does the program have intrinsic understanding of what that object is? The best understanding it has is that that is an organization. But nothing more than that. Suppose now, I went to use a domain, you know, enhance this or replace it using uh, uh, an ontology or domain specific model. So you remember, so then look at this example, right? I said uh, here, figure three, uh, figure four, and look at this example here. this example here. We had seen this before. 
And here, what does it do? Did anybody read this part? Okay, so yes, what did it do? What does it do? It uh, identifies these uh, names as um, kind of concepts rather than just a uh, keyword referring to some entity. What does it mean? First of all, um, do you, can you explain? Did you see, uh, I made a comment there and I asked you to see figure three. This is figure four. I ask, I, I gave you a hint of something interesting about this thing here. Did you see this? I saw that last figure only. You said figure four and some numbering. No, they say, I said also that, you know, there's a, uh, read again. So these are a bunch of classifiers that I use. What are these? These are different days mechanism. This is hidden Markov model. Right? So I have these eight classifiers and then I have the ninth one called KB. KB is knowledge base. What it does it do? It looks at the ontology. Now I don't know whether I described the ontology here in a paper or not. I should have. So I have the ontology here. I didn't give the schema actually for ontology for this case. But what could that ontology have? It would have organization. Potentially it could have public institution versus private company institution. Potentially it will have something like a financial institution versus academic institution versus something else. Right? That means I have the power of describing a whole lot of knowledge, not just the fact that these are the sample examples of organism and hey, this algorithm, go and learn from, tra get trained so that you can find something like this and when you find something like this, it's called organization. That's what the NLP, machine learning based NLP uh, uh, you know, system would do, or name entity recognition system would do. And there are many other methods. The one that knowledge base would allow you to do is to explicitly utilize the fact. And having identified that this is, let us say both of them identify uh, a Federal uh, Reserve Bank of New York as an entity. What this can do is that it can now look up the knowledge base and say, oh, there's a class of regulatory institutions. And within that, there's a class of reserve banks of the country or, cap, you know, or general bank of country or whatever that you know, common word is. And for the US, there are these five or seven. I don't even know how many. There's one in San Francisco, there's one in uh, you know, uh, South and so on and so forth. The number of Chicago, the number of federal reserve banks in the United States. And it will say, oh, there are all these different things. By the way, they are sister institutions. And that will explicitly say, this is in the city New York, and it is at this particular address, if you want, if, if, that, if that is modeled in the ontology. Would you have that facility in the traditional learning based system? Now, I'm not putting down the learning based system at all. Oh, they do fantastic things, and you know, all this until recently, you know, success of Google and all that is all thanks to machine learning. So they are, you know, extremely important for solving a whole class of problems. But there are class of problems where um, having knowledge base would be either necessary or highly valuable. And in many cases, you marry the two, you use both of them. In some cases, you use one or the other. But that level of fine-grained understanding, the meaning, think about it. You read a uh, you know, piece of text, and suppose you are knowledgeable in that area, and you come across um, the term Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Your brain has a lot more understanding of that term 
than just the fact that that is an organization. It goes going to say it's a financial institution. Oh, you know, I have gone by the building of that thing. Oh, you know, the current, uh, you know, uh, uh, the chief of uh, you know, Fed New York is so and so, right? So the depth, specificity of the meaning that you can associate, it's very shallow with some of those techniques that primarily learn syntax or training based on syntax, of the syntax. Right? And the mapping is very simplistic. This term is, all it can tell you is that this is an organization with certain level of precision and certain level of recall. Right? Well, this can tell you a lot more. But there is no free lunch. That is not to say one must use semantic approach anyway. There are costs. Hey, you have to have. So, compared to creating a training set once and training your pastor and be done with it, creating the ontology could be a lot more time consuming if you did not have a lot of tools like the one that we had here. So, most people don't have these kind of tools. We had that, so we could do it. Automatic popularity, right? With this using knowledge extractor to go and getting the get data in, that made our system very powerful. And we were able to create this ontology with much less effort. Others did not. Then uh, then somebody created this free base and then Google bought it. And now Google is extending like crazy. So now they are oh, until and, and that free base was created manually. Until freeware was created, most of the people at Google, if you ask them, they did not believe in any human, you know, manually created stuff. Now they say, oh, this is great, but I think they are smart. Now they, have, they are applying techniques where the rest of the growth is not done all manually, because then it won't be that scalable. So now they are using a lot of techniques and distribution and other things to grow it in largely automatic way, not 100% automatic, I'm guessing. So I think I would, I would really encourage, uh, this is really what the learning is about to me, about this class, okay? That was a very good question, very good counterpoint presented. I presented something at a rather shallow level. Shayans came up with something, and now we have a lot more to learn from. And you really need to re read this to get your money's worth. Look at the references and Further ask the question. So I didn't see any significant question asked about this. Because I don't think people, you know, forget about those who did not have time to look at it, but even the depth at which it was looked at, I don't think you know people have gone through the uh, references and examples as much as. Or if they have, they are not asked questions. Any other questions anybody has here? Do you want to uh, this is really a very important aspect of semantic. Uh, you know this class, this particular you know uh, discussion here. You're always going to have to. Uh, suppose you become a convert, uh, you know, to semantic technology, right? You're going to. There are a lot more people in the world who know NLP and machine learning and all the con you know uh, all the other forms of technologies, information retrieval, compared to semantic technologies because semantic technologies is a little new, right? Machine learning has been there for much, much longer time. So you go to meet those people and you go to have to convince them why they should consider these are semantic technologies. Or that why it can even scale. Or what are the things that this can do that you cannot do and you have problems like that. As Sayers was saying, uh, you know, if, if the domain is very dynamic and the new things keep on coming in, well, I just train on this and there are totally new syntax. To, uh, to, to people uh, that people use, well, the training set does not have those kind of syntax. We did not even have the kind of language people use on of, um, social media today. In 2002-2003, we didn't have Facebook and we didn't have the language uh, of the kind that we see today or we didn't have Twitter even then, right? So the language that has evolved, 140 character stuff and other things 
is new. And so it has new syntactic things. That means the parsers that have been trained on the US thing would have a hard time. There's a paper that I've written, um, and there's work that Mina had done about why the parsers don't succeed very well. So that one is here, for example. So um, here, cement, I believe it is here, semantics empowered social computing, let's see. Yeah. And see here it shows. Lily, I loved your Cheryl, we did do art, Amy. And it shows why a traditional partial would have hard time. Largely fail, right? Now it also, you know, intuitively though, you will see that some of these in in this kind of text, it almost becomes impossible to succeed without background knowledge. So without music brains, there is no hope in the world to address the issues like you know cultural entities and other things like that. And then to, you know, whether Lily is an artist, whether Cheryl is an artist, Amy is an artist, they are persons, they are artists, all these kind of questions to understand. And even if you can figure out that this is a, a person, that is not often sufficient. You didn't do know that is an artist and that is simply a, a fan. Right? And making that distinction. Your, your business application, let's say you want to do advertisement, but you want to do advertisement based on the name of the artist. Then obviously you don't want to uh, you know, uh, advertise based on somebody's personal name or the fan. You, want to, you, know, you need to know that there's an artist, then I'm going to advertise an album from that artist or from the, uh, some other album in the same genre in which this particular artist performs, right? So, one thing, like, I just want to clarify one thing. For ma machine learning program also, you have some ways to understand the things, right? Yes, that, that training set, that example, uh, you know, uh, the footnote number three, that uh, has uh, example training set, and you can Google for it. You can look at the training set, exactly see what are uh, there. The training set is our examples, and uh, more the examples, the better, better the precision recall of the uh, uh, you know training way, you know the, the machine learning algorithms. Right? Okay. So All these machine learning neural nets, yeah. So yeah. Once like uh, there's some new phrase come and. That phrase is not uh, in ontology, or like we don't know whether the organization is available or not in ontology. So we use MLP technique to understand the each and each key entities, like using some knowledge base. Once we learn the uh, about the entity, then we go to the ontology to understand the what the relation between these entities. Is it, it possible? Yes, like? absolutely. It is, it's, it's possible like that. So you may use the um, uh, standard techniques to say this is an entity. But now let me understand more about the entity and you just look up the ontology for that. You can certainly do that and that's often what you might do. So we may have sync, uh, you know, a simplistic rule uh, like, uh, you know, person's name, uh, capitalization of first name and last name. And if you found that and, and then, okay, that is a name of person and now let, let, let me see where I can find that name of that person in my ontology. Is it a name of an artist or is it a name of a sports person? So, like as you said, like MLP is like it's Energy. before that uh, MLP, like a machine learning program or. Uh, it's called okay. It's a all right. Okay. NLP. There are two different terms. NLP, okay. National Language yeah. Processing, and machine learning is a technique. Okay. And so NLP is a field also machine learning, and they are all related. So, like these are all like before the semantic, right? 
So, but these technology are also helping to under like more in semantic technology, right? Yeah, they are. They are. They are. They, they can help each other. So that's why the paper I showed you, our work, uh, you know, uh, the 2002 paper I showed you that uh, you know where we had this example, right? Um, uh, that uh, uses both. With that KB is an ontology or semantic technique, while all the rest were the traditional uh, classifiers, training algorithms that are there, that have been known for a long time. Yes, yeah. it's oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.